Hello, I'm Robert Jones, and today I'm going to look at a chapter from my book, The Top 25 Most Influential Women of the Civil War. And the one we're going to talk about today is from the Union side, and her name's Clara Barton, and she comes in on number three on our list. She was born on December 25th, 1821, so a Christmas baby. She was born in North Oxford, Massachusetts, and eventually she became a school teacher starting in 1837. From 1854 to 1857, she worked in the patent office in Washington, D.C., but because of discrimination against her role as being a woman uh, working in the patent office, the uh, position was eliminated in 1857. 1860, uh, the position in the patent office was reinstated when the Lincoln administration took over. However, Clara Barton was going to have a much different role as the Civil War uh, was, was to begin a year later uh, than working in the patent office. On April 21st, 1861, Clara attended to a trainload of soldiers wounded in Baltimore by Confederate sympathizers. And certainly an important role of Clara Barton during the Civil War was acting as a nurse to wounded troops, both Union and Confederate. Uh, July 1861, she began to distribute supplies to wounded soldiers after Bull Run. And some of these she bought with her own money, others uh, she sought donations to buy the supplies. And this really began uh, what she's most famous for during the Civil War. Uh, yes, she was a nurse, but she was probably more impressive in terms of her command of organization and uh, uh, supplies and logistics. She was very good at procuring this necessary supplies so that nurses and doctors could do their job. August 3, 1862, she received official permission to travel to the front lines uh, for nursing duties. And this was pretty rare that a woman would be given an official pass uh, to be able to uh, uh, move forward into the front lines. 1864, she was made a superintendent of nurses, Army of the James, by General Benjamin F. Butler. 1865, her role changed as the war was coming uh, to a close. She began work as the head of the Office of Missing Soldiers, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. 1870, her nursing efforts uh, moved to Europe during the Franco-Prussian War. She actually uh, received a medal uh, from the Prussian side for her work in that war as a nurse. She uh, uh, became head of the Red Cross on May 21st, 1881, and the first president of the American Red Cross. She had been very impressed with how the Red Cross uh, administered care uh, during the time that she was in Europe. She held that position until 1904 when she stepped down, and in 1907 she wrote the story of my childhood. Now, Clara Barton never actually wrote a full autobiography. She did write the story of her childhood, uh, she died April 12, 1912, but in 1915 an, an authorized biography was published, The Life of Clara Barton by Percy H. Epler. Uh, in more recent times, 1948, a three-cent stamp honoring her role in the Red Cross was released by the United States Postal Service, and on June 29, 1995, a 32-cent stamp of Clara Barton's role in the Civil War was issued by uh, the United States Postal Service. So let's talk in a little more detail about some of the high points of Clara Barton's career. Uh, there's a picture you see of her there. That's the picture she liked the most and the one she wanted to be remembered by. At First Manassas, uh, Barton started a campaign to collect medical supplies in the Washington, D.C. area. She put ads in the newspaper. She collected donations. And uh, she started delivering the supplies to the front when men were uh, wounded. Her success at providing those supplies to uh, Union forces eventually led to her receiving a pass from the Assistant Quartermaster General that allowed her to travel back and forth to the front lines of the Union Army. And when she did this traveling, she typically had as many as three wagons with her uh, brimming with supplies uh, that were used by the nurses and the doctors. She appeared at an awful lot of battles, uh, Cedar Mountain, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Second Bull Run, Harper's Ferry, Wilderness, Spotsylvania, as well as the sieges of Petersburg and Richmond. Uh, the soldiers, uh, the wounded soldiers, called her the angel of the battlefield for her uh, role as a nurse and supplier. And as we mentioned uh, earlier in 1864, uh, General Benjamin F. Butler named her superintendent of nurses of the Army of the James. This would be the only official position she had uh, during the Civil War, uh, except uh, the position that she would receive in 1865, right before Lincoln died. That position, which was one of the last ones that Lincoln approved before he was assassinated, 
uh, was Claire Barton became the head of the Office of Missing Soldiers and uh, today we have dog tags and other ways of identifying remains from the battlefield. They didn't really have anything like that uh, during the Civil War. They didn't really have uh, good record keeping. It was worse on the Confederate side, but it wasn't great on the Union side. So when she came along, uh, she said, hey, we, we need to identify some of these soldiers in unmarked graves. We need to identify places where soldiers were killed and they weren't officially buried. Uh, she started to ask people to send her letters about missing relatives who had uh, presumably died in the war or gone missing. And her first assignment was to try to identify the 13,000 plus unmarked Union graves at Andersonville Prison in Georgia. Now there was a guy there named Dorrance Atwater. He was a prisoner during the worst of Andersonville's uh, activity as a prison. Uh, and he worked as a clerk and one of his jobs was uh, keeping a roll of all the people who died there. So he actually had this information uh, from uh, the time that Andersonville was active as a prison. And he kind of teamed up with uh, Clara Barton as well as representatives of the Union Army. Uh, they all went down to Andersonville and uh, with that list, with the letters that Clara Barton had been receiving from uh, relatives uh, who had, had lost their loved ones, they were eventually able to identify over 12,700 of the 13,000 plus graves that existed at uh, Andersonville. And uh, if you look at that engraving there on the slide, it's hard to see, but uh, there's an American flag in kind of the upper right hand corner of the uh, picture. Uh, and Clara Barton uh, was given the honor of uh, raising that flag uh, when the National Cemetery opened there. Now, I do have a little discrepancy on the next bullet. Uh, some sources, including the National Park Service, uh, said that uh, she identified around 20,000 Union graves, uh, and they include the 13,000 Andersonville in that figure. Other sources say she identified 16 to 1,000 to 22,000 Union graves on top of the one she found at Andersonville. Uh, either way, though, she continued to do it the same way. Uh, she uh, uh, got letters from people uh, and uh, where they thought their loved ones had been killed. Uh, soldiers would write in and say, well, I remember Joe, he got killed right next to me at Chancellorsville, and it was at a certain, certain place. Uh, and then um, uh, she would work to try to identify the spot where they were killed. So what was her motivation for this? Uh, in her authorized uh, autobiography, she's quoted uh, somewhat poetically by saying, Victory, yes, but oh, the cost, the desolation, the woe, and the want that spread over the whole land. 13,000 dead in one prison, 300,000 dead in one year. Dead everywhere, on every battlefield they lie, in the crowded yards of every prison ground, in the dark ravines of the tangled forest, in the miry prison swamps where the slimy serpent crawls by day, and the willow of the wisp dances at night, in the beds of the mighty rivers, under the waves of the salt sea, in the drifting sands of the desert islands, on the lonely picket line, and by the roadside where the weary soldier lay down with his knapsack and his gun, and his march of life was ended. They're in a strange bed, so they sleep till the morning of the great reveille. And Clara Barton kind of took it upon herself to identify as many of these folks uh, as possible. And there was a specific reason that she wanted to do this. Uh, she was very concerned that some soldiers who had actually been killed in battles uh, uh, had been marked as deserters because they had disappeared and the army assumed they were deserters uh, when in fact they had been killed defending their country. Uh, this is also from that authorized biography. The heartbroken friends appealed to me for help, and by the aid of surviving comrades, I gained intelligence of the fate of nearly one half the number of the soldiers. I greatly fear there are some whose names stand today on the rolls against the dark word, deserter, who were never faithless to their trust, who fell on the stern path of duty on the lonely picket line, perhaps, or wounded and left in some tangled ravine to perish alone, under the waters in some dark night, or crazed with fever to lie in some tent or hut or by the wayside, unknowing and unknown, with none to tell his fate or save his honor. Alone with his tarnished name he sleeps, quiet and sweet. And Clara Barton wanted to right that wrong, uh, and if soldiers had died uh, doing their duty, uh, she wanted to make sure that uh, they were not marked as deserters. 
After the war, Barton uh, traveled to Europe, um, actually acted as a nurse during the Franco-Prussian War. She was very impressed with the work of the Red Cross in time. She brought that idea back to America. In May of 1881, she became the first president of the American Red Cross. Uh, she filled that role until uh, 1904. And uh, just a couple other notes. Uh, Claire Barton was also a social reformer. Uh, she certainly stood tall for civil rights uh, after the war. Uh, she was also involved in the uh, women's suffrage movement. And that's our quick note for the day on Clara Barton, uh, nurse, organizer, and uh, logistical uh, supremo uh, of the Civil War and after the Civil War. Thank you for watching.